before we continue to study the depths of our unsearchable inheritance. The unchanging epigraph of our study of the Word of God is the book of Luke 24, 44. And Jesus said to his disciples, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. And so that we as the participants of the body of Christ would share with Christ the fulfillment of all that is written about Him in Scripture, we continue to study our collaboration with the truth of the Word of God and with the Holy Spirit, who reveals the truth in the heart, what we need to do from our side so we can receive the right to the power to put off our former way of life so that we can put on or be clothed into the new way of life or clothe our bodies into a new way of life, into the incorrupt person. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which has been corrupted by its deceitful lusts, to be made new by the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new self created by God in true righteousness and holiness, Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. This is not the only place. And the most troubling is that our calling, our initial calling, the calling of every individual person, many people worry about where their calling lies. <clears throat> they think it's either to be a preacher or to have some kind of specific position or uh, rank within the service, the church, either evangelize or sing or to heal or to perform miracles or to rebuke demons. That's how people uh, consider their calling. And so they say, where am I supposed to be? I once ended up in, a, in a, an American church. There was a great enlightenment, they said, was going on. And I saw how this uh, calling was being in, explained. The leaders came out that had very high uh, titles. And they had a calling, let's start praying for the pastor. Or about pastors, about evangelists, about signs and miracles and a lot of different directions they were giving people and they came out uh, to the stage and where the evangelism was and where signs and miracles almost all of the church or mem or the people that were there uh, gathered to that area where the signs and miracles uh, were to be prayed for and the other in the other area was to be praying for the pastor and there was only one person who went into that uh, area to pray for the pastor. I, I became very saddened. One, why? Because people do not understand that their well-being absolutely physically and spiritually depends on this one person, that, that pastor, to pray for him. Because only through him can God give them not uh, give them salvation, but any promise, the entry of any into any inheritance of any promise for all of the promises are in him, yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us, Apostle Paul says. None of us can inherit any promise. None of us can receive anything from God, anything, only by this person. And we see he's the only one standing, one person only there, and everybody else praying for evangelism. And so, blessed are you before God that you understand where your calling lies. Your calling is not to try to bring the world to faith, but it, to be able to do that, to bring the world uh, or have them pay attention to God or faith, you need to be a light. You need to cast off of yourself your old man with his deeds, renew your mind by the spirit of your mind, and then after that, clothe your body into the new person. You'll say, but this is not possible, but this is our calling. And if it's not possible, then it would not be, have been written here. And it begins as soon as you understand the essence of your calling, you already are blessed. You already are on the right path. You are already a light because you began your, uh, fulfilling your calling. You are a light to the world because you don't uh, worry about where to go or what to do, but you work on yourself. As Jesus said, 
what good is it if a person obtains the whole world, gains the whole world, but loses his soul? Or what will a man give for his soul? There's, uh, what difference is it if I save the whole world, but I go to hell? And someone con- convinced me, and so they convince you that once you receive uh, repented, you're saved, and that's a, that's a lie. I, you only receive the, the guarantee of salvation as a seed. As we talk about, when you invest something, you invest money for a, for a home, this doesn't mean that this house or this car, or whatever it is you're, you're putting a down payment on, you're investing into, you, uh, that you own it. Only when you pay the, comp- the entire price, you, you legitimately sign all the documentation, then it becomes your possession. It is the same thing here. The salvation and all of the promises of God, all of salvation is given in the form of a seed. And it needs to fall into the soil of, of a man's heart, but a good soil, so that we can grow it into the form of fruit. And when we grow it into fruit, then it will become our possession. This is what it means to invest the silver of your salvation or turn it so that it can profit lose yourself in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ die for your nation the house of your father and for your destructive desires as soon as we understand this then we become a light to the world you begin to work on yourself you begin to see yourself you didn't see yourself previously but you now begin to see yourself you said the wrong word and you catch yourself what am I doing I don't have the right to say these words I don't have the right to behave with my children, with my husband, with my wife, with my pastor, my manager. I don't have the right to say this or behave this way. You begin to catch yourself. And you not only begin to discipline your mouth, you discipline your mind. Because discipline of the mouth are directly linked to the discipline of the mind. Because the kind of mind you have, uh, the Proverbs say, that's how who you are. The kind of thoughts God had is who He is. He took uh, the the thoughts that He had and He uh, spoke them. And He created the world. And before He created the world, He created it for us. He created this world so that it would be for His saved people, His His people. To fulfill these three, the, these... Uh, Three, these three, the this commandment, uh, commandment, these are destiny impacting, commanding, and fundamental acts. Put off, be renewed, and put on, and put off, renew, or clothe yourself. Fulfilling these three destiny impacting, commanding, and fundamental acts will determine whether we transform ourselves into vessels of mercy or vessels of wrath. Or more accurately or specifically, will our salvation happen that is given to us in the format of a seed or guarantee? And this is our justification or not, which is why our names that were written into the book of life when we made a covenant with God will forever be blotted out of the book of life if we don't cast the old man off of ourselves, if we don't renew our mind, and if we don't clothe our body into the new person, our names will be blotted out of the book of life. The most important thing is it needs to be done by faith. Receive this promise into your heart and begin to meditate about it. Proclaim the not existent as existent. Uh, Meditate that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, that in it the stronghold of uh, incorruption or immortality is erected, that the old man is bound, I died for sin, I live for God, and I proclaim that a uh, non-existent, uh, incorrupt body as existent. Only those will be clothed into incorruption that already had it in their heart. They grew this, uh, this new body in their heart into the fruit of righteousness. In a particular format, we already looked at the process contained in the first two acts and stopped to study the process of the third act. And this is specifically... What conditions do we need to fulfill so that by the means of our already renewed mind, we can begin the process of clothing ourselves into the power of the glory of our new person that is created according to God in Christ Jesus in righteousness and holy truth. 
Relevant to this, we stopped to study the allegory contained in the 18th Psalm of David, where the Holy Spirit, with the wisdom and power that He alone has, reveals the demands according to which we are called to collaborate our faith prayer with the name of God El Elyon, or God Most High. Because everything that we can receive, we can receive it by prayer. We need to tell God what we want to have. When God reveals any kind of promise to us, we need to say within our heart, Lord, may it be according to your word, and then pray that God fulfill this promise, reveal the desire of your heart, that the desire of my heart are not the desires of the flesh, but the desire to fulfill your will, the desire to fulfill this calling to accomplish or achieve the goal that God has placed. The essence of this condition consists in this, that in the circumstances of our hardship, when we are putting off the old ma- the old man, this is the most difficult time of our life when we are casting off the old man with his deeds. We can at this time call upon the Most Highest to our God and confess the faith of our heart, saying who God is to us in Jesus Christ. What This needs to be inside of us in our heart. It needs to be put there who God is to us in Jesus Christ. He is to us a Father, the Heavenly Father in Jesus Christ. Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father who is in heaven. We'll say, Our Father that lives in heaven. But God says, I live in heaven. But the heavens of of God is also His church and also the heart of a person, the programmable system of God. This is also, these are also his heavens. They are connected. These are three realms that are connected one with the other one. And so who God is to us, what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, he already has become righteousness and sanctification for us, but only in Jesus Christ. Someone needs to teach us how we need to put ourselves into Jesus Christ. What conditions do we need to fulfill so that the Holy Spirit would place us into Christ? He can't place us without us, and we can't place ourselves without Him. We need to collaborate with the truth of the Word of God and with the Holy Spirit so that we can receive Christ into our heart and then place ourselves into Christ. What He has done for me who we are to God in Jesus Christ. We are His children, we are His nation, we are His uh, descendants. And so, in us, we have the genetic program of God, His character. And when we grow by the form of sanctification, then we will start looking more and more like God. We will be in His likeness, being here in this body. It is an incredible news, it is incredible information, the angels are watching this transformation, it's happening. God has His chosen remnant in whom this is happening, that are ready to pay the price and whose heart is cleansed from dead works. What we need to do to inherit all that God has done for us in Jesus Christ. We've noted that the given allegory is one of the most powerful and all-capturing and voluminous examples demonstrating the collaboration of our renewed mind as King David with the name of God Most High and their violent conflict with our carnal mind in the form of King Saul and with governing sin as our old person with his deeds. Three anointed by God kings live in one body and all want this body and fight between each other and there's a field of battle and this field of battle is our heart. It surprises the saints, how is it that governing sin or the old person can be anointed by God? Then we need to understand what anointing is. Anointing is power, authority. There's no power that is not placed by God or authority. How did the old man receive authority uh, from God over my body? In what way? Because when I was born again, or you were born again from God, being born again, this genetic program has the holiness of the Most High, His law, and it reveals this governing sin inside of us. 
Apostle Paul writes, in what way sin begins to govern? The law reveals it and gives it power, anoints him to power, and he begins to govern in our body. But at this time, we also have the new person, also lives within the body. And God has anointed him also to govern over this body. Because how else do you look at the circumstance? The living Saul, he was anointed by God. God anoints another king over the same kingdom. If there are two kings, then this kingdom will not last. How can two kings rule over one kingdom? But there's three kings, and all are anointed by God. And here we need to now, we need David, our new person, to overcome, overcome governing sin as well as our mind, our intellect that is linked to governing sin. Because the arrogant intellect of man is directly linked. He with his arrogance presents the kingdom of darkness when he says, I don't understand things like this, I don't agree with this, I have my own mind, look how arrogant the mind can be, how they uh, magnify themselves, how much God has done through me, instead of preaching the truth <clears throat> about the cross of Christ, the truth about the blood of Christ, preaching how you need to cast off of yourself the old man by the form of these uh, two truths, they preach what God has done through them, what he, who's, who he's healed, and how many churches they've created, and <clears throat> all the other good work they've done. But this is a calamity of its sort, and it doesn't just uh, draw these people, but those who listen to these people to hell. They think they're directed toward heaven, that they're, but it's drawing them to hell. They confess Christ, but what Christ do they confess? What Christ? There's no Christ like that in the Bible. If they confessed Christ, would they be waddle, waddling uh, uh, the way that they do upon the stages, shouting and screaming and dancing before, as if for, before God? No one has ever danced in that kind of way before God. Ever. God is a great choreographer. He's also, if you dance, the dance needs to reflect God's glory, God's might, God's holiness, God's truth. What is a dance? Is an, that's expression of something. What are these people expressing? What are they expressing? As one recently, rep person who recently repented, he went to a so-called charismatic church and came, came came back from there. As my, he says, my brother took me to that charismatic church. He told me, when I saw how they were worshiping God, he told his brother to quickly get him out of the church, because he said, if you don't get me out of here, I might rape someone, because that's how they were worshiping. Worship needs to bring forth pr prompt uh, uh, a reverence before God and trembling before God. It is by the means of confessing the faith of God that is concealed within our heart, consisting of who God is to us in Jesus Christ, what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, who we are to God in Jesus Christ, that we're not just some kind of distant relative, we are the children of God, we're born from the seed of the word of truth from God himself and what we need to do so that we can inherit all that God has done for us in Christ Jesus, who, what he has prepared, what he has put upon our account in Jesus Christ so that God can receive the proper foundation that he needs to join the battle for our earthly body so he can shame the governing within our body sin that is the old person with his deeds by crushing, by the crushing power of his redemption and with noise forever thrust him out into hell. In its character, the prayer psalm of David contains, this 18th psalm contains three parts where we see demonstrated an example of the character of our legitimate prayer, which belongs to us as kings, priests, and prophets of the Most High. 
first part identifies the state of the heart of David as a warrior in prayer, which is the required basis for the legitimate status of his prayer as a a priest to bring an offering. This is talking about a prayer as an offering, and an offering can only be brought by a priest. An infant in Christ can't be a priest. He can't, he doesn't understand this, the uh, formation of an altar, how he makes himself into an altar, and what an altar is. These are God's goals. And what is upon the altar are the means for achieving that goal. And so when I have a goal, call a calling, then I have I am an altar of the Lord. But in order to achieve this calling, this goal, I need means. I need to fulfill conditions. I need to become an offering upon this altar so that I can fulfill that calling. And so the kind of heart of a warrior of prayer will be is how his prayers will be. The second part opens up the consistency of legitimate prayer itself, which belongs to kings, priests, and prophets only, which gives God the proper basis to deliver us in the image of David from the hands of all of our enemies, from our intellect, which is arrogant, that is always trying to show itself, and the old man, our corrupt desires, that actually work hand in hand. The third part illustrates the prayer battle itself in an epic way, which is beyond the limitations of the typical human mind. That goes on in our body for the possession of our body. The virtue of a king consists of our mind being renewed by the spirit of our mind, which gives us power to the right to rule over the emotional aspect of our body and lead them under the bridle as a horse of battle. Be a prince. I like this expression, prince. Uh, Christ is also called a prince. Because uh, this word prince is a person who is able to control his horse, has in his possession a horse, He's, uh, he's the owner of this horse, one a, a horse that is in love with the rider and the rider loves his horse that doesn't beat him so that he continue to move the horse himself knows and he waits for any uh, change in the owner's behavior movement and he will even go to the death if he needs to this is a horse that understands his owner and so people who work with horses understands that if you deal with a horse in this way of beating or in other ways, that's not how they work and you can't do that. Uh, the feelings need to understand that we can heal them, we can protect them so that they follow us. The virtue of a priest gives us the power to the right to run to God as warriors in prayer so that we can perform legitimate intercession for the adoption of our body by the redemption of Christ, which is our calling. The virtue of a prophet gives our new person the right to enter the devir, or the holy of holies, so we can hear the voice of God above the lid of the golden ark within our heart, which is the throne of grace in scripture. And it allows us to hear God in our heart, and it allows God to hear our intercessions and respond to them. This virtue of a prophet, this is the ability to hear the voice of God by the preached word. And at this time, God also hears our voice when he opens to us his promises and we say, let it be according to your word, Lord. And as soon as we say this, God immediately responds with his voice as it happened with Mary. You see the, the, the dialogue. He hears her and she hears him. The power of the Most High shall come upon you, and that what will be born of you will be holy. And she said, let it be according to your word. And as soon as she said it, let it be according to your words, God heard her, and at that moment, she conceived. Her ovary was fertilized by the seed of the word that the archangel told her. It's the same thing here. When we hear the preached word, this is the seed. And when we understand that this seed is my calling, 
I need to grow it into fruit, I need to say in my, I say to myself, Lord, may it be according to your words. And the Lord immediately hears it because you understood, you agreed, and immediately you now become this, this seed, then you're, fer- you're fertilized by this seed, and it is now our calling to grow it, to water it, to watch after it, to keep it in your heart, keep it in such a way that no one would be able to find it. I mean, like when they came from Jericho, uh, if you remember uh, when those people came to Rahab and looking for uh, looking for the two spies, that symbol of the Urim and Thummim, the truth and the Holy Spirit who reveals the truth in the heart, she hid them. Uh, in the upper uh, er- area of her of her dwelling, and she said, "Well, they left. They're not here." And she sent them in in a, in a different direction, and they left. She came and told them, "Now you are free." And they told her, "If you will keep our this oath we have between us." Uh, when we come and attack the city, we will spare you and your household, uh, and you'll put the uh, scarlet uh, o- over your window, and so that they can uh, see it, so that it be there. And when the nation came to destroy Jericho, there was a command to destroy everything, uh, but don't touch where there's a red, the red scarlet where it w- the the was out of the window. Don't touch that house or her. Today, the men of study who and, and archaeologists who uh, tried to unbury Jericho, it, they were surprised. The walls of Jericho were pushed into the ground with such a force as like a knife goes into butter. It was a very powerful uh, uh, walls that they had in Jericho and one of the areas not far from the gates, uh, that's where this woman Rahab was living, and only that one place remains un, uh, not destroyed, and everything else was. And we know what happened uh, later. She becomes wife of uh, the Jewish king, and this line then brought forth David, and da- from David came, as we know, Christ. It's very interesting, a very interesting analogy and symbols and they all happen in our heart, every one of us individually. In a specific format, we already looked at the first part and stopped to look at the second part, which opens up the consistency of legitimate prayer in the eight names of God Most High. El Elyon, in Hebrew, as meaning God Most High. Getting to know and confessing the power that is contained in the heart of David and the eight names of God allowed David to love and call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised so that he can be saved from his enemies. If I don't tell God, if I don't call upon him, although he wants to save me, he won't even move a finger. We need to call him with legitimate words. We need to have the right of a priest to call upon God. Not like Hagar who is... who is shouting to God and saying, sure, Lord, have mercy, but God is not looking at her. He heard the voice of the of the boy. Why the voice of the boy? Because he gave, a, he vowed uh, that he would save Ishmael. He, he promised that to Abraham. And because of Abraham, because he was as a priest before God, God saves Hagar. Hagar maybe thought, oh, God responded to my prayer. No, God responded to the prayer of Abraham not the prayer of Hagar at that moment. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord, who is worthy of praise. Worthy of praise, and I have been saved from my enemies, Psalm 18, 1 through 4. We have a wonderful opportunity where we can all together as a church confess who God is to us in Jesus Christ, what he's done for us in Jesus Christ, and who we are to him. This is confession of these eight names all together. While we study them, the Holy Spirit likes it when not one or all of us individually, but we as a choir all together, let us 
we already know how to do this. Lord, you are my strength. Lord, you are my rock. Lord, you are my fortress. Lord, you are my deliverer. Lord, you are my rock in whom I take refuge. Lord, you are my shield. Lord, the horn of my salvation. Lord, my stronghold. May he establish this for us and may this be in the heart of every one of us individually and make you strong and immovable in faith in a specific format as much as the Lord has allowed and according to the measure of our faith we already studied our inherited lot in Christ Jesus in the power of five names of God these are strength, rock, fortress, deliver and living rock and stop to study our unsearchable inheritance or our inherited lot in Christ Jesus contained in the name of God living shield Considering that the given nature of prayer where David confesses his inherited lot in the eight names of God Most High identifies the covenant that is made between God and man, all of the numbers in Scripture are mysterious because each one has a great meaning of either promises or name of God or us together when we say spirit, soul, and body. This is the, the number six. When we say the Church of Christ, this is seven. When we make a covenant with God, this is eight. In the eighth day, they circumcised the child and they gave the child a name. At this time, he had a covenant. In the eighth day, he made a covenant with God. And so this is symbolic. Number eight, number of the covenant we see David turns to God based on the covenant. Why does he not bring forth ten names? If he would turn to God because of his holiness, he would have presented ten names. <clears throat> if he would have turned to God because of direction or government, it's twelve names that he would have listed, but he is talking about the covenant, which he then presents eight names for. Getting to know the eight names of God which identify God's covenant with us is a strategic teaching which is purposed to be the calling of every warrior in prayer, ones that have the virtue of kings, priests, and prophets who are anointed to rule over their earthly body. And if a person has not accepted the given to him anointing to govern over his calling, which is his mortal body, in the status of a king, priest, and prophet, so that he can change it into the virtue of a heavenly body, then this revelation that is purpose for worshiping God in prayer will not benefit him in any way. I trust that we it already benefits us greatly, and we are not those that were yesterday or the third day uh, we renew ourselves every single day and become stronger. God becomes closer. The promises and the fulfillment of the door of our hope that are the promises, they're supposed to be fulfilled. The name of God's shield presented in Scripture as a living shield is elevated in Scripture for warriors and prayer as their military equipment or weaponry. We need to be clothed into the power of the name of God shield because it in scripture is presented n not just as the name of God but also as a living armor uh, and weaponry the purpose of such a shield is called by God to block us and protect us as warriors in prayer who battle for the interests of the will of God for the adoption of our body by the redemption of Christ and to give God the legitimate basis to stand at our right side as well as between us and our enemies so that in the one and other situation he can take the hits that are directed at us by our enemies upon himself. We need to fulfill specific conditions so that that will allow us to find ourselves in the place and the time where the power of the name of God in the virtue of a living shield will receive a legitimate reason to stand between us and our enemies so that he can take the hits that are intended for us by our enemies upon himself. I'm bringing forth one of the places of Scripture, and we will see many more places. And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. 
why did he go ahead of them? He was showing them the way uh, to the Canaanite land, the promised land, and suddenly he went and stood behind them. And the reason was because the enemies uh, arrived, the the army of Egypt was was coming after them, and he stood between them and the Israelite nation. And the pillar of the cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all that night. Exodus 14, 19, 20. And so while this was happening, they needed to believe that the enemy will not be able to touch them because they heard the noise of the chariots and the and the horses. They heard voices uh, of the of the uh, soldiers of the army, and they were afraid, of course. But Moses said, "Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid when you hear all of this." And so sometimes it's with us the same way. We're afraid, but we don't know that between us and our enemies is God. When we know this, then we will begin to trust upon God. We all have many, very many different needs and enemies that are constantly attacking us, and we always have fear. For example, tomorrow... There's going to be, uh, I'm going to go to court for a violation or whatever it may be. Be calm. God is already between you. He has already moved from the front to the back. Begin to thank God. But if a person will shout and be afraid, he will be in God's way. He'll stand in God's way. God can protect us when we trust Him. But we need to trust. When, if, when something happens, remember that God is already between you and whatever has happened with you. When you know this, then you begin to say something. You begin to thank God, saying, Lord, thank you that you have stood between me and that danger that is threatening me, whatever it may be. Thank you that I am already saved, and you will see the great hand of God. In the given circumstances, when the... Egypt of our soul tries to return us or take us back to slavery, our new person collaborating with the name of God's shield will hear the noise of the pursuing enemy who is targeting himself against us, the one that we were initially delivered from. And it happens that this fatal hit or blow that is directed against our liberty from sin falls upon Christ who will be taken from the earth and will be nailed to the cross. Psalm 69, 8, 9. I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children because zeal for your house has eaten me up and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. And so his house is us and zeal, he has zeal for us. The, and the wrath of God needed to pour, be poured upon us because we were born in iniquity and sin. Our parents in their seed have passed on to us a genetic code that Adam received from the fallen cherubim. And, of course, God's wrath is, is kindled upon the inheritance, but this inheritance is in our body. This is the old person, and the Son of God stands then between us and our enemy. And the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Therefore, the quality and lexicon in identifying the name of God's shield, as with the previous names of God Most High, are not able to be found in any dictionary of the world. So to be our living shield so that he can take upon himself the hits of the evil curse that pursue us by the sinful seed of our fathers, this is to protect and block us from the wrath of God protect and block us from the deception of the evil one. From the words of deception, because there are many false prophets, false apostles, false teachers, there are many churches that think and call themselves Christians, but they're actually synagogues of Satan. But when people don't know this, they say something's happening there and they listen to it. And so this living shield will protect us from the deceptions of the evil one protect and block us from the evil and slanderous tongue that can kill us, protect and block us from the curse of all nature of illness, protect and block us from the curse of poverty, protect and block us from the curse of untimely or 
early death and protect us from the sinful life that was passed on to us from our fathers. Looking at this list, which contains such intervention or such protection from all nature of existing enemy, the Holy Spirit in the given prayer psalm of David, in the meaning of the name of God's shield, has hid or concealed the inherited lot of the Son of God, in whom and by whom every person collaborating their faith with the faith of God, with the living shield of God, is called to not only be protected from their enemies, but also to receive the victorious ability to keep and increase the profit. A shield is not just a means of protection, but also a means of attack. Upon the field of battle, warriors were able to use their shield uh, in a way they can hit their enemy and kill them with the shield and split even their the sometimes the head. They can uh, hit the enemy with it. It was simultaneously a, a form of armor. It was a, a, you could protect yourself with this and attack with it as well. And there was no other, really, uh, form of armor that served for both in both ways because you can't just defend yourself without attacking. And so if there's a territory that is yours by right and the enemy's there, and all you do is defend yourself, but you'll never receive your territory back, you have to attack the enemy so that you can take back what it belongs to you. And so we are called to receive the ability to keep and increase the profit received from the invested silver of our salvation that has been turned to profit in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, which consists of adopting our body by the redemption of Christ. This is our calling and is a component of the promise of imperishable food. Considering such a necessary tandem or such a union of God with man, it is vitally important for us to determine the role of God and the role of man in each aspect of our essence. If these roles will not be identified correctly and a person begins to fulfill God's role, he in this way will take upon himself God's name that he is God and God will not be able to help him. Many children of God in understanding their role are often fulfilling God's role. We need to learn God's role and our role. God will help us when we fulfill our role. As soon as we fulfill our role, God will begin to help us. And so we will need to answer uh, some questions. According to Scripture, what are the identifications and qualities of the name of God in the purpose of His glorious name, Shield? What purpose, being in the role of our protector, did God allocate for Himself? And what role has He placed upon us? What conditions do we need to fulfill to provide God with a proper foundation to allow us to enter the unsearchable inheritance of His name in the virtue of a living shield of our faith? And by what signs do we examine ourselves as to whether we are truly collaborating our faith with the faith of God in the virtue of His name, shield. Considering this, we need to not forget that all of the acts of God relating to His protection are called to happen by collaborating our faith with the faith of God, which contains the protection of God, where we see the role of God and the role of man clearly identified and outlined. And this means that without a strict and voluntary obedience to the preached word spoken by the person who possesses the authority of a father of God and his helpers that are in the same spirit with him, we will not have any opportunity to receive profit in the form of the fruit of righteousness from the seed of guarantee that we have turned to profit or that we have invested. For all of the promises of God in him are yes and in him amen to the glory of God through us. 2 Corinthians 1.20 because God in all His powerful and unchanging names can be the lot of our inheritance exclusively in the situation when this lot becomes the component of the confession of the faith of God that is concealed within our good heart, a heart that is cleansed from dead works. 
and before we received the right to the power to confess our inherited lot that is contained in the name of God's shield as the component of the faith of our heart, it is necessary to pay the price for the right to be a student of Christ, whose heart is able to receive the seed of the planted word and grow it so that it can demonstrate its power and the fruit of righteousness that is manifested in justice. And we will remember that only that person that thirsts to hear the word of God drills into this word, lives by this word, abides in this word, and this word abides in him, is able to stand in battle against the ancient serpent and escape the deceptive nets of the, of the devil so that he can inherit the adoption of his body by the redemption of Christ. Therefore, without our collaboration with the powers contained in the name of God living shield, representing the faith of our heart, we will not be able to please God. Hebrews 11.6, but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, because our shield will be the faith of God that abides in our heart. We stop to study the first question, what identifications and qualities do the scriptures give the name of God contained in the virtue of his name, a living shield, that is concealed in our heart. Of course, it is in Scripture, but if it's not concealed in our heart, then it's not taken from Scripture by the preached Word and not put into our heart, then you won't even need to study it because there's no, it won't be any use out of it. Four of the components in identifying the power of the name of God living shield have already been subjects of our study. In short, we will remind ourselves of their essence and after which we will study the next. First, God demonstrating the virtue of his name living shield, taking upon himself the hits that are directed at us by our enemy, is a shield only to Abraham and his descendants. Not for the whole world, not for all denominations. If a denomination does not acknowledge Abraham as their father, then... God can't be their shield. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Genesis 15, 1. I won't elaborate further on this place because we have sufficiently given time to it. After which God said, uh, why he said, after he left his nation, the house of his father, and he went into the Canaanite land, and he uh, separated from Lot, he left his soul. Lot was a symbol of his soul. When he separated with his nation, the house of his father, and his soul, and when uh, there were Babylonian kings that attacked this Canaanite land, the carnal mind, it attacked to take control of the emotional aspect of this body. These were kings that, that lived in Sodom, Gomorrah, and the other uh, cities. They took uh, control of them. Abraham, when he came into this land, he became responsible for this land, and so he went and took control back from these Babylonian kings, and he liberated these five kings. And these five kings were a symbol of his senses, his feelings, uh, the five senses. And he also conquered his intellect. He left, he changed his intellect. He renewed his mind. Uh, and in this way, he was able to meet Melchizedek, the king of, of Salem, in the Canaanite land where he was a high priest and king. And Abraham brought his tithes, if you remember, to Mel, uh, Melchizedek and Melchizedek. Melchizedek uh, blessed him. Second, God demonstrating the virtue of his name, living shield, taking upon himself the hits that are directed at us by our enemy, is a shield in the blood of the covenant for those who applied the blood of the lamb Pesach on the lintel and doorposts of themselves or their essence. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt, Exodus 12, 13. We see here that God in his living shield, he shows himself in the covenant of blood that he made him with us. And it is a protection. 
if it is upon the lintel and doorpost, this blood is applied, uh, the blood of Jesus Christ. We have believed, we have received our justification for our spirit, our soul, and our body because the soul is the lintel and the body and spirit are the doorposts. Third, God demonstrating the virtue of His name living shield, taking upon Himself the hits that are directed at us by our enemy, is presented in the truth of the Word of God, concealed within three functions of our essence, in our good heart, in our renewed mind, and in our gentle or meek tongue that confesses the faith of God that is concealed within our heart. When these three institutes of power within our essence work with one another as one as one command, then this command, these three, this is a living shield of God, shield and buckler. His truth shall be your shield and buckler, Psalm 91.4, because truth can protect us when it passes through the renewed mind that simultaneously is collaborating with the mind of our spirit and our spirit works with the Holy Spirit when there is this kind of connection this uh, collaboration takes place then uh, his, his truth will be our, our shield and buckler saying Lord save this won't work you need to tell him what's in your heart Lord thank you for your protection that is within my heart. This is your word. I have put into my heart so I not sin. May this word be a protection for me and my household. When you pray, and I pray with such a prayer, then God, in the form of our living shield, stands between us and our enemies. He shows us himself in his the truth of his word. We've noted that as a buckler and shield, the truth of the word of God can be concealed in our heart exclusively within the commandments and statutes which abide within our heart, which gives us the legitimate right and ability to confess them and fulfill them. Fourth, God demonstrating the virtue of his name, living shield, taking upon himself the hits that are directed at us by our enemy is revealed in active protection of sovereign boundaries protection of our sovereign boundaries, protection of his, of ours and then his sovereign boundaries and the protection of the sovereign boundaries of our neighbor. He is a protection of our sovereign boundaries, but as our sovereign boundaries are also God's sovereign boundaries because we are God's holiness. And so we need to understand this is not separate as we are God's uh, holiness, our Boundaries are God's sovereign boundaries. And he's also the protector of the sovereign boundaries of our neighbor. You shall not remove your neighbor's landmark, which the men of old have set in your inheritance, which you will inherit in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Deuteronomy 19.14. I also won't elaborate much on this. We already know already uh, what the landmark is and who our neighbor is and our new person and our neighbor is our new person and fifth God demonstrating the virtue of his name living shield taking upon himself the hits that are directed at us by our enemy reveals himself in favor but only to a righteous person as a response to the favor of man toward God or the favor that man shows God God's favor is our shield where a man defends or protects the interests of the will of God for you O Lord will bless the righteous with favor you will surround surround him with uh, sur- him as with a shield and so with a favor you will surround him as with a shield and so this shield Psalm 512 and so this is talking about also the girding of our mind For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor you will surround him as with a shield. God blesses the righteous one with his favor, who is God's living shield, who is a uh, crown upon his head and no evil thought can 
enter our heart, when we have this shield, when we meditate about spiritual things, spiritual thinking, and not carnal thinking. In the given place of Scripture, the righteousness of a man is perceived in his favor for God that God in turn responds to with his own favor. The righteousness of a man is a man's favor to God. And God shows his favor to the one that shows favor to him. Grace for grace, as you remember, it's written, not race, uh, grace instead of grace, or other verse. Sometimes uh, there's some Bibles that have this translated, but it's really grace for grace. When I show my grace, my favor toward him, because the word grace is favor, it's thanksgiving. When I thank God for my justification, then in this way, I demonstrate my favor to him, and he then responds with his favor to me as a shield. And so when God responds to man with his favor, which serves as a living shield for the righteous, crowning their mind and making the mind of the righteous inaccessible for the penetration of any evil thoughts that arise against God in the face of his messengers, even thoughts. Sometimes people came to me and and said, Pastor, I don't know what to do. I have terrible thoughts about you, uh, just terrible ones with profanity and other things. And I understand the thoughts that are coming. And I ask, you don't want these thoughts? No, we don't want them, but I don't know what to do with it, they say. And why? Because you have not demonstrated your favor to God. You are not fulfilling God's commandments. When you fulfill God's commandments, then God will respond with His favor and will make your mind inaccessible to these thoughts. Why? About not about someone else, but specifically against the pastor, these thoughts come. And this is not just one person who's come to me with this kind of same uh, complaints. Uh, brothers and sisters, what do I do? I have these terrible uh, words and, and sometimes profanities and other things in my mind against you. And so when we fulfill God's commandments, because when if we love the Lord, we will fulfill His commandments. And this will be our favor to God, our thanksgiving, and He will respond then with His favor and will protect us with His favor, uh, our mind, He will crown our mind, and then no evil thought will penetrate our heart, because our heart, uh, the thoughts come into our heart through our mind. A righteous man in Scripture can only be one who demonstrates his favor to God by obeying his faith to the faith of God spoken by the person that carries the seed of the word of truth and fulfilling this truth in in the statutes of God. The favor of God as a response to our favor that we show Him is a component of His foreknowing and predestining where He demonstrates His favor to us from the position of eternity before our existence or our origination. God has already demonstrated His favor toward us before the creation of the world. Why? Because before we were created, He already saw our favor to Him. When we hear His statutes, His commandments, He will He sees that we want to fulfill them, we fall in love with them, and, and so forth. And it, in the original, it says, from eternity. The Lord has appeared of old, and in the original it says, of old, from eternity or from everlasting. To me saying, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness I have drawn you. Jeremiah 31.3 Looking at this place of scripture, we can conclude that when the first particles of dust of the universe did not yet exist, God foreknew and predestined each one of us by our future reaction to this truth that preached to us word and placed us in Christ Jesus so that he can liken us to the image of his son so that he be the firstborn among many brethren. Romans 8, 29 through 34. For for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, he first he first foreknows, and then he predestines those who also he also called. 
whom he called, those he also justified, and whom he justified, those he also glorified. See the sequence here. What then shall we say to these things, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for for us all, how shall he, not with him, also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Yes, they fall, yes, they sin. Who can bring a charge against them? God justifies them. He justifies them, not because they did something, but because they are placed into Jesus Christ, because they have acknowledged the work of Christ, that God justified them freely by grace in the redemption of Christ, that God in Christ has reconciled them to himself, not accounting their sins, and have given them the word of reconciliation. And this is who will bring a charge against God's elect. It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. Why do you condemn them? He's saying, Christ already died for their sins. Why are you condemning them for sins? It is Christ who died for their sins. And furthermore, he also has risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. He stands at the right hand of the Father and continues to intercess for us. Although we fall and sin and rise again, fall, sin, rise again. But the righteous will fall seven times and rise again. Why is he righteous? Because he's righteous, because not because of what he's done, but because what the Lord has done for him. That's why we often pay attention to what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. He justified us not accounting sin to us, and he condemned his son for our sins. And so who will be bold now to come and condemn us? And so imagine when we say something about one another, he or she did this or this. Imagine what we're doing. We are casting against God. We, God died for this pers- these people. He justified them. He took, uh, He became a living shield for them. And you then, what? who are you to say this? Are you without sin that you say these things? That's why I ask you again, never spread rumors about each other. Never accept rumors about one another. And even if a person has sinned, pray about them. Don't condemn them. Pray for them. When we do this and behave this way, then you will see that between us, there will be an atmosphere and God's presence will be greater and greater. The foreknowledging of God where he foreknew the reaction of each one of us to the truth of the preached to us word before the creation of the world is confirmed also by the prayer of Apostle Paul that is written in his epistle to the church of God that was in Ephesus because there is no church of Ephesus or Corinth or Portland or uh, Odessa or or Venetian or whatever other churches may be called, there is a church of God that is in all different locations. The church of God that is in Corinth, the church of God that was in Ephesus, but we oftentimes say, and they say, well, whose church is this? Oh, this is the church of Arkady. This is the Church of Jesus Christ, not the Church of Arkady. This is the Church of Jesus Christ. Arkady is just the Apostle of the Church. That is placed as an Apostle of the Church. But the Church belongs to Christ. And He is a part of that Church. And it's funny, people will say, Who is the pastor of this or this Church? Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him, that is in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Ephesians 1, 3 through 5. We 
when it says that uh, without blame before him in love, when we love for one and love one another, we are compassionate uh, with one another, and we are not rejoicing in the fall of our brother or sister. To give us rest in our partaking to Israel as warriors in prayer, we are partaking, uh, we have a partaking to Israel to give us rest and to give us hope and trust upon God in the time of tests and trials by sorrow, God turned our attention to His capabilities of being able to foresee where He foreknew us and loved us because of our reaction to the birthright in Jesus Christ. And as Esau in the form of the man of the flesh, He hated because He forsook the birthright in Jesus Christ, because He forsook it. You know, many people forsake the birthright in Jesus Christ and they are rejected by God then. Let us see what this is. The prophetic word of the Lord through Malachi. Malachi 1, 1 through 5. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. They are in a difficult situation. God tells them by uh, prophet Malachi, see what state they were in at this time. I have loved you, says the Lord, yet you say, in what way have you loved us? This is questions they're asking God. This is the state they were in. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord, yet Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated, and laid waste his mountains and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness, even though Edom has said, we have been impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I will throw down. They shall be called the territory of wickedness, and the people again against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. Your eyes shall see, and you shall say, the Lord is magnified beyond the border of Israel. Esau represents within our body the uncrucified nature of our soul that is supported by governing sin in the form of the old person with his deeds, who neglects or forsakes the birthright of Christ, because he does not want to be placed into Christ. Because to be to have the birthright, you need to be placed into Christ. To be firstborn, to have the birthright being firstborn, you need to be placed into Christ. Because he is firstborn, Christ is fir- firstborn in God. And how can we become firstborn? We, we need to be placed into Christ. To be placed into such a church that in virtue is a good wife that ha- that is the narrow gate. A church where the fullness of the gospel is being preached, the 12 foundations of the wall of the New Jerusalem, the 12 pearly gates, the 12 oxen, the 12 stones upon the chest- breastplate of the, of the high priest that we are studying, the stones of the high priest, as warriors in prayer. And so I say here again that Esau represents within our body the uncrucified nature of our soul that is supported by governing sin in the form of the old person with his deeds who neglects or forsakes the birthright of Christ because he does not want to be placed into Christ so he can, so we can have justification by faith in Christ Jesus And rather, he establishes a personal form of righteousness that resists and fights against the righteousness of God that is given to man in Christ. And so when someone's focused on speaking in tongues, practicing spiritual gifts, and doing some sort of good work, when they try to do these things, they think now they will be righteous. And they, in this way, resist the birthright of Christ, the righteousness of God, because the birthright of Christ is in the righteousness of Christ. And when we receive justification by grace freely, at this time we give God the proper grounds to place us into Christ. He gives us knowledge in this moment and gives us the ability to see the church and the person that is head of the church who is a father of the church. He has a a heart of a father and he has the seed of the truth, the revelation. These people begin to hear. It's interesting that some people being amongst us many years have abandoned us. But many people that have that are in other countries, other churches, 
continue to live by this truth, I receive phone calls from all the churches that are in Portland and also from other uh, nations, people from different, from different denominations that are beyond our border. And they say, we thank God for the word that you have. And we count ourselves as members as well, although they are in other churches. They didn't come out from there, but they're listening. They're either gathering in small groups. We don't even know how many of these unofficial groups exist. God knows. He gives this good news. He spreads this good news so that this truth would be able to be accepted into that heart that is thirsting for it. God already foreknew them. He knows that when He presents them with this truth, they won't resist and will not continue to establish their own personal righteousness. In the body of Christ, these are people that are of the flesh these are people that have rejected the righteousness of God and have hated those who have loved the birthright who have placed themselves into Jesus Christ for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work only we, only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way and then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power sign and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved Second Thessalonians 2 7 through 10 because they did not love the truth they hated the truth and so that's why and we're talking about the truth in Christ the truth is in Christ it is not in us but it is in Christ and when we are placed in, into Christ then the truth is also in us and we are placed into Christ when we receive justification freely by the grace uh, by the redemption that is in uh, through Jesus Christ when we leave our nation the house of our father and the destructive desires of our soul it's not possible to receive justification not having left first the house of your father, your nation, and your soul. People need to be told these things and taught these things because they receive justification thinking they receive justification. There are such teachings. You receive justification. I've heard it. How these false charismatic uh, teachers, and they don't teach how to leave your nation, how to leave the house of your father and your de- the destructive desires of your soul. They don't have teaching about the blood of Christ and the cross of Christ. They don't understand what the faith of God is and what our faith is. They don't understand the difference between my cross and the cross of Christ. That's the most terrible thing. And these are all not just false charismatic services and also the other so-called generals of God that God has not called to do this they were evangelists and needed to remain as evangelists and they saw the success that they could have and uh, have uh, announced themselves as pastors and they will not be able to grow them into full measure of growth in Christ and God has become angry at them and he's not giving them that word they can do whatever they want and try to practice it as much as possible but whatever they know and so they know a cross of Christ is not just a stick that's been carried but and so they see our cross they mix that with the cross of Christ because they can't see the difference who doesn't take up his cross and doesn't follow me so they understand it's not the cross of Christ that I need to be carrying and so that's not what we're talking about right now but I'm just showing this example summing up the given component we conclude that God demonstrating his name in the form of a living shield taking the hits that are directed at us by our enemies we conclude that God demonstrates himself in the shield of his favor to a righteous person as a response to the favor this man shows God whom he foresaw and he foreknew before the creation of the world 
Sixth, God demonstrating the virtue of his name living shield, taking upon himself the hits that are directed at us by our enemy, demonstrates himself in the all armor of God that is given to us in the form of a living shield of faith that we are instructed to arm ourselves with so that we can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. But above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Ephesians 6.16 The fiery darts of the wicked one are thoughts and words. These are the fiery darts of the wicked one. This is false truth. These are fiery darts of the wicked one. The damaged truth that people often hear. These are the fiery darts of the wicked one. The shield of faith is the fullness of the teaching of the gospel that we can protect ourselves against against these fiery darts of the wicked. And if we are unable to not able to identify the fiery darts of the wicked one, we will not have any need to fulfill specific conditions and use specific means so that we can provide God with a foundation to be our living shield who takes upon himself the hits of the fiery darts of the wicked one that are directed against us. According to the identification that is in Scripture, the fiery darts of the wicked one are false testimonies of our neighbor that are directed against us. Our neighbor. Testimonies of our neighbor. When a wicked or lawless speaks, you are protected from them. But when a neighbor speaks, a man who bears false witness against his neighbor is like a club, a sword, and a sharp arrow. Proverbs 25, 18. Not his enemy, but against his neighbor. You perceive him to be a neighbor, but he is spreading deception about you, a false testimony. He speaks about you things you haven't done and things you haven't said, but he spreads about you that you said these things, you've done these things, and he was a witness of this, and not just him, but others also who saw and did and heard this. And when it comes to you, And the scriptures say that this is a club, a sword, and a sharp arrow. And so if we have a living shield, we will be able to defend ourselves from the fiery darts. The reason why our neighbors are able to behave in such a way is hidden in their jealousy or because of their collaboration with their old person, who is a programmable system of the fallen cherubim that is passed on to him in the sinful seed of their father in the flesh. Although we have been born from the seed of the word of truth and our new person has become the programmable system of God with the existing in it program of justification that is received by us in the format of a guarantee in our body remains the programmable system of sin in the form of our old person with the existing in him genetic program of sin. And in this way, the program that we give preference to and the one we collaborate with will become our present and our future. Sometimes this neighbor being maybe an infant, spiritual infant, He is collaborating with the one program and the other. He is not yet uh, established. He is tossing to and from. He is listening to one, third, uh, second, third. And when he hears the third one uh, and he speaks the truth, so-called truth, very differently, and he says, well, this general has said this. They call him a general. You can't, uh, of course, uh, explain anything sometimes to an infant But when you have one, this is your shield, because you're not worried about what others say. You're worried about what the the one whom the Lord has placed is, is revealing and telling you, the one that represents a father in your church and that passes on to you the revelations of God. After we were born from the seed of the word of truth, we were offered a choice to either collaborate with the program of death that is in the programmable system belonging to governing sin that lives within our body in the form of our old person, or with the program of immortality that is in the programmable system which is our sacred person that is born from God by the preach to a seed of the word of truth. After God made a covenant with the sons of Israel upon Horeb, God told the people the following words by his servant Moses. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, 
in that I command you today to love the Lord your God. To, I command you today, today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways, and to keep His commandments, His statutes, and His judgments, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go possess. And so, if we keep his commandments, his statute, his judgment, then he may, then we will be able to live, and he will multiply us. He'll bless us, and Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear, and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses to, to, today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them. Deuteronomy 30, 15 through 20. From this we can conclude that when the heart of a saved person <clears throat> or saved people who have received their salvation in the seat of justification, which is, a, which is a format of guarantee of their salvation, instead of turning it so that they can profit in the death of the Lord Jesus and die for their nation, the house of their father, and for the corrupt desires of their soul, so that they can own their salvation in the fruit of righteousness, they turned away from the given to them holy commandment and have turned themselves into doers of the program of death and became the enemies of God as well as our enemies, which is why they de their deceptive words that are directed against us have become fiery darts of the wicked one. And if their deception is exposed, they say, friend, it was nothing personal, I was just joking, when you expose them. It's rarely, rarely they're exposed because you're not going to go to them directly and say, is it true it's often passed on to you from someone else? Uh, People just lock it away and look at this person w unhappily w why they s would say these kinds of things about me, why they would spre spread this kind of information about me. But if a person is exposed, he says, friends, it was nothing personal, I was just joking, just like one man who served said to me once, he was a close to me relative, who I when I exposed him, he uh, he was spreading deceptive things about me. He said, sorry, Satan confused me. He says that Satan confused him. He was spreading about me that I read uh, um, things of magic and hypnosis. And, and when I exposed him, I said, what are you saying about me? And he said, sorry, the devil confused me. And so, like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, I was only joking. Proverbs 26, 18 through 19. And so, they, it's, it's showing here very clearly. It is specifically in this way that many saints transform themselves into categories of the called, who refused to invest the silver of their salvation and became madmen in the midst of our churches, as their heart became a quiver for the fiery darts of the wicked one. Here's what David says about this. My soul is among lions. I lie among the sons of men who are set on fire, whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp sword. Psalm 57.4 Those who were around him, close to him, who came, who went to the house of God together uh, with him, and cried together, and they, what they were doing behind his back, and these, this information would reach his ears. He, he, they would report this a, he says, I am among lions. As I said, more than a little more than 10 years I was going to church and I felt with every cell of my body this a deception and this hatred. Now I come as from a, a very freezing day into a warmed room. 
Why? Because the wicked one took all the lawless with him. And so, some of us may not be perfect, may fall, and they say things, but they feel that, and they condemn themselves for those things, and they uh, ask for forgiveness. They don't just say, well, I'm joking, but they actually come and ask for forgiveness. If you pay attention to the state of the heart of the Heavenly Father, and upon his words that are written in prophet Jeremiah when <clears throat> the redeemed by him nation for the most part instead of dying for their nation the house of their father and for the corrupt desires of their soul and in this way invest the guarantee of their salvation so that they, so that they can receive their salvation as a possession in the format of the fruit of righteousness this nation unfortunately chooses the opposite and buries the given to them silver of salvation into the ground Jeremiah 9, 2 through 9. Oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place for travelers, that I might leave my people and go from them, for they are all adulterers and assembly of treacherous men, and like their bow, they have bent their tongues for lies. They are not valiant for the truth on the earth, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me, says the Lord. Everyone take heed to his neighbor, and do not trust any brother, for every brother will utterly supplant, and every neighbor will walk with slanders. Everyone will deceive his neighbor and will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies. They they weary themselves to commit iniquity. Your dwelling place is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit they refuse to know me, says the Lord. Therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will refine them and try them. For how shall I deal with the daughter of my people? Their tongue is an arrow shot out. It speaks deceit. One speaks peaceably to his neighbor with his mouth, but in his heart he lies in wait. Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? Shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? And today God is seeking a lodging place in travelers that are in the wilderness who are clothed into the all-armor of God, for which they paid a price of total sanctification, so that they can worship Him in spirit and in truth, and finding them, He finds rest for His heart by pouring out his revenge upon the collective of people who call themselves Jews, but in essence are not. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading, therefore I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. Ezekiel 28.18 According to this place, of scripture, we conclude that however much the wicked and lawless may rejoice right now, being successful in their deception that they direct at the chosen by a God remnant that they themselves call truth, when the time of harvest comes that they won't be able to escape, the fire that the fire that was kindled by their arrows in the spoken by them words of deception that were brought out of the evil treasury of their heart will be turned against their own essence. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Matthew 12, 35-37 An evil man is an unclean or wicked person who was previously holy but afterwards abandoned the straight path so that he can walk the path of darkness and began rejoicing in doing evil, admiring evil perversions which has crooked paths and wanders on his paths of error who abandons the leadership of his youth and forgets the covenant of his God. Behold the wicked things brings forth iniquity yes he conceives trouble and brings forth falsehood. He made a pit and dug it out and has fallen into the ditch which he made. His trouble shall return upon his own head and his violent dealing shall come down on his own crown. Psalm 7, 14 through 16. A good man is a person who performs righteousness, which is a fruit of his holiness, which abides within his heart and that he confesses with his mouth in his continuous prayer. Have mercy on me, O Lord. Consider my troubles from those who hate me, who lift up me up from the gates of death that I may tell of all your praise in the gates of the daughters of Zion I will rejoice in your salvation the nations have sunk down in the pit which they made in the net which they hid their own foot in, is caught the Lord is known by the judgment he executes the wicked is snared in the work of his own hands meditation the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God for the needy shall not always be forgotten the expectation of the poor shall not perish forever 
Psalm 9, 13 through 18, by themselves the fiery darts of the wicked one, which are the words of people that fill our churches, will return on their essence when we demonstrate the righteousness of God in His, in his holiness and turn their fiery darts toward their own essence and in this way fulfill the written judgment of God, because the function of a living shield are in located are located in the status of our righteous heart and confessing with our mouth his justice. My defense is of God who saves the upright in heart. God is a just judge and God is angry with the wicked every day. If he does not turn back, he will sharpen his sword. He bends his bow and makes it ready. He also prepares for himself instruments of death. He makes his arrows into fiery darts, uh, shafts, Psalm 7, 10 through 13. The fruit of righteousness and the entrails of our new person from the seed of the right of righteousness that was received by us by the preach to us word of truth is identified in scripture as a quiver for arrows arrows that are within the quiver is a symbol of the fruit of holiness behold children are a heritage from the lord the fruit of the womb is a reward like arrows in the hand of a warrior. So are the children of one's youth. Happy is a man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Psalm 127, 3 through 5. According to the above stated words, we conclude that to take the shield of faith or provide God, the foundation to be our living shield means to clothe yourself into the confessions of the faith of God which abides in our heart. Confessing such faith that we have received by the preached to us word by the messengers of God representing for us the delegated fathership of God and his helpers, whose words come from his spirit and are in one spirit with him, in this way to possess the power of the faith of heart is to be a carrier of the faith of God that is received by us by the preached to us word by the messengers of God, which upon practice means to continuously abide in the preached to us word and allow the preached to us word to abide in us. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 31, 32. When we begin to confess with our mouth the preach to us word that is received by us into our heart, they become a living shield that is able to silence all the fiery darts of the wicked one. With this, we, as we have established more than once, that this is... It is us specifically that become responsible before God for the person we choose to listen to as well as for the choice of how we listen to Him. Depending on this choice, we'll determine whether we receive the living shield of faith that is able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. The scriptures say, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scriptures say, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. Romans 10, 18-12, summing up the given components, God as our living shield, who takes upon himself the hits that are directed against us by our enemies, is uh, us collaborating our faith with the faith of God, and he in his favor is given giving us his truth that in the quiver of our heart are our arrows in the fruit of our spirit and with success we can resist at our gate and we can be protected from the fiery darts that they release. I apologize that I may have uh, held us up a little bit longer than normal. Uh, Let us now bend our knees and our heads and we will pray and thank God for the words that we were able to receive today. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I thank you together with your saints for this great and glorious and wonderful word that has become a living shield. It is in our renewed mind, and you crown us with your favor as with a shield and no evil thought can penetrate our heart that Satan releases it in the form of arrows so that it can strike us we thank you that you have become our living shield in the truth of your word 
May your mercy be blessed for your people now and forever. May your nation be protected from these evil darts of the wicked one and may they find the ability to be your quiver and in this quiver they'll have arrows arrows that they can release against our enemies may the back of the enemy be bent over forever and may your saints rejoice with a great joy and may they be delivered from the power of sin and may they rejoice your liberty and sing your liberty and be glad may all this be upon your nation and be fulfilled upon it amen our father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen and now let us proclaim our unchanging manifestation now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.